Good afternoon. You're all very welcome. My name is Paulie Murphy. Um, could I remind you, those who need reminding, before we begin, that you do as I do and switch your mobile phone to off. Uh, the presentation today is part of a series um, on populism and the challenges to the liberal order, <coughs> which is co-hosted by uh, the Institute and Trinity College Dublin in association with Trinity Research in Social Sciences. Uh, we had uh, last week a presentation in this series by the Minister for Finance, um, who uh, gave what was, to my mind, uh, a very impressive presentation. Um, summing up in broad terms what uh, his conclusion was, uh, I think it was that uh, populism arose uh, partly from uh, the uh, propensity of uh, the liberal order uh, to create unacceptable inequalities. Uh, but he wasn't writing off the liberal order, and I, here I use liberal in the sense of this side of the Atlantic and not the other side of the Atlantic. Um, he saw um, measures to be taken uh, by governments to counteract this uh, tendency to inequality, and he specified uh, inequality of opportunity. Uh, we have today um, a um, speaker uh, in the shape of Professor uh, Jeff Colgan, uh, who is an associate professor um, at the Political Science Department of Brown University and the Director of Security Studies at the Watson Institute of International and Public Affairs. Um, I won't preempt what he has to say, but I think uh, from what I know of him, he will be giving a more international view of the problem. So we look forward very much to hearing from you, uh, Professor Colgan. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd yeah. like to. Well, good afternoon, uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, <clears throat> it's an honor for me to be here today, uh, and a pleasure to be back in Dublin. Um, you know, there's no country on earth that is more welcoming to a redheaded visitor than, than Ireland. Uh, it's hard to blend in as a redhead in, in the Middle East or Latin America or wherever you might go. Uh, but here I have a shot, at least until I open my mouth and then the, the gig is up. Um, I was invited to speak about uh, The Liberal Order is Rigged, which is an article that uh, Robert Cohen and I wrote uh, in March 2017 uh, for the journal Foreign Affairs. Uh, and we were reacting to two events that were then quite recent, the Brexit referendum in the UK and the election uh, of President Donald J. Trump. And we pointed out that, that analysts of international relations had until then focused heavily on factors like the rise of China, uh, ongoing Islamic terrorism, and a resurgent Russia. Um, but the biggest threat to the liberal international order that the West had created in the years since 1945 was not from these external forces, but from within, that domestic politics in the West were crucial to understanding world order. Uh, and the liberal or international order is a set of governing arrangements, underpinned by a set of ideas and manifested by a set of institutions, uh, like the United Nations, the IMF, uh, NATO, the European Union, and the World Trade Organization. And while the liberal order has been an extraordinary success in certain ways, uh, it has also become self-defeating, partly by contributing to deepening economic inequality and the politics that follow from it, and partly because of missteps by self-satisfied elites. And so today I want to share our analysis with you uh, but also update it. Over the last couple of years, three broad visions uh, have emerged about the liberal order. 
The first is to hold on to maintain yesterday's uh, version. The second is to rip it down. Uh, that's the, the populist revolt we see in many countries, including the United States. Uh, and the third is a progressive counter-revolt led in the United States by people like Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. And I want to suggest to you that an international order is politically sustainable um, only if it meets three criteria. First, it has to share the wealth within liberal societies and, and do so visibly. Second, it has to harness international cooperation. Myopic nationalism hurts everyone. And third, it has to respect national communities. Uh, and that has consequences for immigration, uh, dealing with information warfare, and, and much else. And each of the three competing visions that have emerged recently fails on at least one of these three criteria. And that suggests that those of us who care about international order, and I imagine most people in this room do, uh, still have some work to do. Uh, so let's take each of these three visions uh, in turn. Start with the, the post-1945 liberal order. Uh, it has multiple successes. First and foremost, it helped preserve peace among the great powers. And it's easy to lose sight uh, of the magnitude of that accomplishment uh, over the, the last 70 years or so is a uniquely peaceful period among major powers, uh, at least since the end of the Roman Empire. And the stability provided by the liberal order discouraged countries such as Germany, Japan, Saudi Arabia, uh, and South Korea from acquiring nuclear weapons. The order also allowed Europe to rebuild after World War II and then the developing world to advance unevenly, but with billions of people rising out of poverty and new middle classes burgeoning all over the world. But for all its successes, the order's institutions became disconnected uh, from domestic society in the very countries that created them. A neoliberal economic agenda, especially after about 1980, uh, eroded the social contract that provides the crucial political support needed for the liberal order's long-term survival. Many middle class and working class voters in the United Kingdom, the United States, and elsewhere came to believe, with a good deal of justification, that the system is rigged. Those of us who have not only analyzed globalization and the liberal order, but have celebrated them, uh, share some responsibility for the rise of populism. <coughs> We did not pay enough attention as capitalism hijacked globalization. International institutions were created by and for economic elites uh, who created firmer links between themselves and governments. And ordinary people were left out. So let's put some facts behind that. Between 1974 and 2015, real median household incomes for Americans with no college education fell by roughly 20%. Those with college degrees saw their incomes rise by 17%, and even more so for those with graduate degrees. So the bill for that broken social contract came due in 2016 on both sides of the Atlantic. Since then, we have continued to see signs of populist dissatisfaction. Uh, the Gilets Jaunes uh, movement in France and Belgium is an obvious case. Um, Italian, Austrian, and Danish politics are more complicated, but also animated by populist anger. Of course, economic factors are, are not the only thing that matter. Social values, identity politics, and partisan polarization played a vital role. And social scientists have had a good time over the last two years arguing about whether it is economic factors or non-economic factors that do most of the work in explaining um, the, the rise of populism. Both things matter. There's no question that if you survey voters about their con uh, concerns, what gets expressed tends to be social values and issues of trust in society, not the details of economic policy. Right? That's not top of mind for most most voters. Underneath, though, economics matter. It always does. And whether in Weimar Germany, uh, where the Nazis flourished, or in Venezuela in the 1990s that produced Hugo Chavez, 
Stagnating, unequal economies breed populist discontent. Two international factors uh, exacerbate this problem in today's Europe and North America. The first was a loss of social solidarity brought on by the end of the Cold War. During that period, the perceived Soviet threat generated a strong US attachment, not only to its alliances, but to other multilateral institutions. And social psychologists have demonstrated the crucial importance of othering in identity formation for individuals and nations alike. A clear sense of who is not on your team makes you feel closer to those who are. And the fall of the Soviet Union removed the main other uh, from the American political imagination and thereby reduced social cohesion. And this was especially problematic for the Republican Party, uh, which had long been a bastion of you know, tough on communism, anti-communism. And with the Soviets gone, the Republicans' bete noire gradually shifted from communists to Washington elites. And Trumpism is the logical extension of that movement. In Europe, the end of the Cold War was consequential for a somewhat different reason. During the Cold War, leaders in Western Europe um, constantly sought to stave off the domestic appeal of communism and socialism. After 1989, no longer facing that constraint, national governments and EU officials in Brussels expanded the union's authority uh, to that trend and Oops, sorry, uh, expanded the union's authority and scope, even in the face of a series of national referenda that expressed opposition to that trend and should have served as warning signs uh, of growing um, working class discontent. And that points to the second exacerbating force, namely multilateral overreach. Institutions like the UN and the EU can facilitate cooperation and solve mutual problems. But doing so requires that countries curb their autonomy somewhat. The natural tendency of such institutions, like all institutions, is to expand their authority. On each occasion, there is some seemingly valid rationale. The cumulative effect of such expansions of international authority, however, is to excessively limit sovereignty and give people the sense that foreign forces are controlling their lives. The Brexit vote demonstrated the consequences of a lack of responsiveness in Brussels to national concerns, even though, ironically, the utter mess that British politicians have made of Brexit might actually reinforce the complacency in Brussels. Multilateral institutions must never assume that voters have no alternative and must do whatever they insist. Voters always have an alternative. So collectively, these failures of the liberal order uh, helped generate a populist revolt in many countries. And that revolt manifests the second of the three visions uh, I identified earlier, namely to rip down the liberal order. And I am not a fan, but let's give this vision uh, its due. Uh, it gets a few big things right and I'll name four. China is a real problem. Burden sharing in alliances like NATO uh, is not always well balanced. The gains of economic integration uh, are not being well distributed in the United States, especially, uh, but also much of Europe. And immigration does bring challenges, even if populists exaggerate them and then mix in racism and xenophobia. So the populist vision is a nationalist one, where each country looks out for itself. Multilateral cooperation is thin and rare. And international politics is transactional <coughs> rather uh, than based on relationships. That approach is profoundly flawed because it has countries withdrawing from the world just when we need more international cooperation, not less. Two big risks from this uh, approach jump out immediately. The first is climate change. Uh, our planet has a fever, and humans are the cause of it. The damage we are doing to our world will far outweigh the cost of taking sensible steps right now to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions. Yet we are failing to do so, 
And part of the reason we are failing uh, is that each state hopes that the rest of the world will move first so that it won't have to bear so much of the cost. Populists and nationalists have no answer for that problem, and by extension, no answer to the central global threat uh, of our times. As if that wasn't enough, the second big risk is the rising chance of major power war. Populists want tough-minded realism, but tough-minded realism is in some sense a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. It weakens the economic and non-economic bonds between states and creates an atmosphere of, of distrust. And of course, positive diplomacy does not mean that you know, pretty words can, can make whatever world we want. But ideas matter, and people always have choices. The wrong words can push the wrong ideas. And in the long run, the wrong ideas could put major powers on the path to war. So these two big risks are flanked by a host of other ones. Uh, we need a coherent Western response to various abuses by Russia, by China, by the Saudis, and by others. And we also need to manage the increasing complexity of interdependence among liberal democracies. And all these issues, the populist approach to a foreign policy is a dead end intellectually. It has inspired, though, a third vision uh, of foreign policy <clears throat> by those on the progressive left. And here I must limit myself uh, to speak only of the American progressive left, uh, because it is the one I know best, though I believe there are parallels in other countries as well. Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, uh, two probable contenders for the Democratic Party uh, presidential nomination in 2020, uh, each recently gave major foreign policy addresses describing their outlooks. And so scholars and analysts like my colleague Dan Nexon have added to this collection. Progressives want a long list of changes to U.S. foreign policy, particularly uh, current U.S. foreign policy. And the list includes a, a recommitment to allies and to multilateral deals, like the Paris Agreement uh, on Climate and the Iran nuclear deal. They want withdrawing US troops from Afghanistan and Iraq, giving labor leaders a seat at the table for international trade deals, greater transparency of cross-national asset flows and curbs on corporate tax havens, protecting the electoral uh, process from foreign interference, reversing huge tax cuts for the rich that exacerbate the deficit and uh, crowds out other government priorities, and a recommitment to uh, nuclear non-proliferation and arms control. So they get a lot of things right in that list. Uh, above all, they understand that the dividing line between foreign and domestic politics has disappeared in the 21st century. Elizabeth Warren writes that actions that undermine working families in this country ultimately erode American strength in the world. But progressives also tend to dodge some of the big issues. And the clearest case of that tendency is on the crucial issue of immigration, where progressive leaders barely mention it at all. It is an issue that they would rather not talk about because different parts of the progressive coalition want different things on immigration. Uh, and that approach won't cut it. While their leaders waffle or remain mute, some progressives have led a social ca uh, media campaign hashtag abolish ICE, uh, referring to the, the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. And that creates the impression that progressives want open borders and no limits on immigration at all. Other progressives want immigration with sensible limits, but that message gets drowned out. And by contrast, the populist right has a very clear message on immigration. Populists blame immigrants for crime, strain on public services, demographic change, and loss of social solidarity. Like it or not, that message is appealing uh, for a significant part of the electorate in many countries. Uh, maybe not this one, we were talking about that at lunch, but many countries. Uh, fear and xenophobia are powerful political weapons, and plenty of demagogues on the right know how to wield them. 
Populist discontent is also not all racism and hatred. Populists have tapped into a genuine desire for sustaining national culture. That desire is understandable, and it is keenly felt in almost every nation on Earth. It is undeniably true that immigration can change a national culture over time, even though, as progressives would point out, immigration is part of what enriches a national culture, too. The real question here is about how to balance social tradition with social renewal. Besides immigration, progressives can also be a bit incoherent on trade. And they talk tough on China or Mexico, but they also praise the WTO and criticize things like Trump's NAFTA uh, replacement. So progressives leave voters confused. Do they want trade or not? Um, and they are not clear enough that the desirability of trade depends crucially on one's trading partners, especially trade among complex economies. Good trade rests on tr trust relationships between countries and a certain degree of compatibility between domestic systems. So if we return to the, the criteria for a sustainable order that I mentioned at the outset, we see that each of the three alternative visions uh, fails on at least one of the criteria. Clinging to yesterday's liberal order does not spread the wealth nearly evenly enough, which rots the domestic support for it over time. Populist nationalism does not harness international cooperation to meet the crucial challenges of global interdependence, uh, most notably climate change, but other things as well. And the progressive alternative does not do enough to respect national communities, at least on the issue of immigration, though it does do better than most on uh, you know, emphasizing the need to protect elections from foreign interference. So how to move forward uh, in, in a better direction? <clears throat> Let's turn those criteria uh, for a politically sustainable international order into design principles. Right? Start with the principle uh, of harnessing the power of multilateral, multilateral cooperation. Not every issue needs to be solved at the global level, but there are some things that we must do together as a world community, despite our very real differences. Climate change, arms control, dispute resolution and peacekeeping, uh, protection of the oceans, preventing disease pandemics are all candidates for this type of cooperation. On these issues, the liberal democracies of Europe and North America have to cooperate with autocracies like China and Russia. Let me say one more word about climate change. Um, the Gilets Jaunes in, in France, who got started by protesting a hike in fuel prices that the government justified as an environmental measure, are only one of several indicators, if you look around the world, that the costs of preventing climate change cannot be placed disproportionately on the working class. Just the opposite, in fact. Elites must face the fact that if they want to pass on uh, a good world to their children, they must, no, we must, be willing to bear the bulk of the cost of at least the first steps uh, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so I find promising the discussions in the US Congress of a Green New Deal, uh, which marries environmental and inequality concerns together. The second step is to design trade deals and other forms of economic integration, which includes the movement of people uh, and money as well as goods, in ways that shares the wealth among the working classes of liberal societies. And in practice, I suspect that means linking the most favored nation principle to the compatibility of domestic economic and legal systems. While liberal democracies can and should cooperate with autocracies in some areas, they should reserve the strongest forms of cooperation to other liberal democracies. And my re recommendation here reflects the trajectory of Russia and China over the last 30 years. There was a time, especially kind of in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when Americans and Europeans hoped or believed that by integrating Russia and China into the world economy and giving them membership in the WTO, we could shape their economies in a more capitalist direction bound by the rule of law. 
It might even lead to democracy. And today, I think the hard facts are, are quite clear. Russia and China are as autocratic as ever, and they are not going to change due to external forces. In fact, their governments are likely to take advantage of openness by liberal democracies to suit their own needs. It is with regret, but also a dose of real urgency, that liberal democracies must tighten market access against non-liberal societies. The main reason for doing so is to help uh, ensure that the gains from such integration are shared internally, domestically, uh, and that trade deals do not undermine the working classes or national security. Yet the club model of integra economic integration comes with an important side benefit, namely that it generates an incentive for semi-autocratic countries or fragile democracies to liberalize and to maintain the rule of law so that they can be part of that integration. The third principle uh, is to respect national communities. And that can be translated into policy in a variety of, of domains, both foreign and domestic. Uh, I'm especially drawn to proposals from political scientists Ken Shibi and Matthew Slaughter. They call for a reversal of the re regressive tax cuts in the United States uh, and plowing that money back into lifelong learning initiatives to raise human capital in the working classes uh, in the United States. Those proposals are, are needed more in the US uh, than in Europe, but nonetheless, Shivi and Slaughter's focus on career-long education and incremental retraining is something that deserves I think more attention even in Europe. Uh, economists like Danny Roderick and, and Gabriel uh, Zuckman ha also have some good ideas. I think Europeans would be especially wise to confront Roderick's trilemma, um, which stipulates that there are you know, three things of which a country can have at most two, namely national sovereignty, electoral politics, and deep economic integration. So there's tension between those three. As Roderick points out, most politicians in Europe gloss over the trade-offs uh, and are vague about what balance between those three uh, that, that they favor. And regrettably, only the xenophobic nationalists are really clear about where they stand with respect to, that, to Roderick's trilemma. They, they prioritize national autonomy and electoral politics at the price of international integration. They're willing to give that up. On immigration, I think centrists and progressives must have a clear answer that favors controlled immigration. I'm an immigrant myself. Um, we should clearly and firmly reject the idea of completely open borders as unwise and politically unsustainable. But moderate immigration uh, enriches a nation materially and socially. Uh, it's really beneficial. Immigrants should be able to earn their way to full citizenship over time. Uh, but that does not mean that they have to have full access to all parts of the welfare state from the very first day that they arrive. More broadly, those who favor international cooperation must have a simple message to match the likes of Donald Trump, <laughs> Nigel Farage, and Marine Le Pen. Populism has a clear, marketable ideology defined by toughness, nationalism, and nativism. Like it or not, America first is a marketable slogan. To respond, proponents must offer a similarly clear, coherent alternative, and it must offer an appealing vision for our children's future. So put these three elements together, kind of a thin network of global cooperation on certain key issues, a thick club model of uh, economic integration among liberal democracies, and a set of national policies to support international openness. And you get a kind of multi-speed form of international order. And I think you Europeans know more about the pros and cons of multi-speed uh, uh, integration than we North Americans do, um, but it is high time we caught up. The post-Cold War kind of unipolar moment uh, is over. And the United States cannot afford to have a monolithic vision for world order. Successful cooperation will be 
differentiated cooperation. So let me wrap up by returning us to that moment in the closing days of World War II when the liberal order was originally designed. Before the Cold War even began, the liberal order was built to avoid the dangers of excessive nationalism. Today, nationalist ideas ride again. Donald Trump declares himself a, a nationalist. It is an ideal, ideology that will probably never be wholly defeated. There will always be some who want to twist the identity of a nation to serve their own purposes. And I think it is time that progressives, centrists, and liberals of all stripes went on the attack for the battle of national identity politics. The challenges are from within and from without, whether it is ethno-nationalism in the White House or authoritarianism in Beijing and Moscow. Like the answer to those challenges, uh, let the answer to those challenges be a rejuvenated liberalism, one tempered by the lessons of history and the desire to create opportunity for all members of society. Liberal society is based on freedom, pluralism, democracy, enterprise. At its best, it brings together market competition with social solidarity. That is a vision that is appealing, and it is one that works. And stack that up against the Chinese or Russian model anytime, anywhere in the world, any day of the week, and let's see who comes out on top. Thanks so much for listening.